My name is John T. Tan, a Singaporean-born Brit who has recently moved back to my country of birth. Over the past few years, I've been on a personal journey of discovery, learning about my heritage, understanding what it is that makes Singapore feel like home, and defining the things that lean my heart towards this island country in Southeast Asia. Join me as I uncover what it is that makes me the local immigrant. Throughout this journey of self-discovery and finding out a little bit more about myself and why I consider Singapore to be home, I decided to speak to a friend of mine who was a psychiatrist, is a psychiatrist. He is a close friend of mine and I asked him essentially to analyse me and my life to be able to explain a few things that I was still a little bit unsure of. Um, this episode is never before seen footage. Um, if you've read my book, The Local Immigrant, uh, you will be familiar with some of the content here because I talk about it in the chapter that is titled Going Deeper. But today I'm really looking forward to showing you a conversation that I had with a psychiatrist to discover a little bit more about what makes me feel at home here in Singapore. Hey buddy, how's it going? Hello, I'm good. Yourself? Very well, thank you. Uh, so, as you know, uh, I thought it'd be cool to have a conversation with you as a professional psychiatrist, but also yeah. one of my best friends in the whole world. Um, and, and in the whole world, the reason why we're on FaceTime, obviously, is because we are 8,000 miles away, um, but also about 90 centimetres away at the same time, which is good. Yeah, so my, my understanding of... Uh... My role today is to try and help get to the bottom a bit maybe of why you feel at home where you do and, and a bit about the journey that it's taken you to get there. Is that fair enough to yeah, say? Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to like, I don't have, you know, this isn't an area that I necessarily specialize in um, from a work perspective, but I've been a psychiatrist for a little while now, um, so for over 10 years, so hopefully I'll be able to help you to get to the bottom a, a bit of, of, of that, and I've known you, as we say, for longer, so hopefully I have some relevant expertise. And for the last decade, you've been telling me, telling people that you analyse us every time we hang out, so... Yeah, yeah, I've done <laughs> a lot of work in your situation, where you're concerned, Johnny, so hopefully I'll be able to bring that to there. <laughs> awesome. So I guess we're going to start off and we're going to talk a bit about home. So I, I wonder, um, what, what does that word mean to you when I use the word home? What, what, what's, what, are the, what does that conjure up for you? What do you think it means? What are, what are some of the feelings that go with it? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's, it, it's where I am right now. It feels like home. Um, it has my family here. I think that's probably a big thing with, um, with the kids and with Millie. Um, but I think with church, we always used to think about home. We always used to welcome people home on a Sunday. And I think we always used to define it as a place where people belonged, where they felt like they could totally be themselves. And I feel way more like that here in Singapore than I do anywhere else in the world. The UK included, where I lived for 34 years or however long it was. Um, and so to come, I would say home is a place of, of comfort but also a place where you you feel totally yourself. So, I mean, a lot of what we're going to explore today is a bit about your journey to get to that place where you feel at home, not just in terms of the room that you're in right now or your family situation, but also in terms of where you are geographically, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to kind of pull out the classic psychiatrist card and start off by asking you a bit about your childhood, if that's all right. Yeah, do. Um, and I was wondering about two things, I guess. And one of them is, I wonder when... What, what are your earliest memories of home? Like, where are they and, and what are they, if that makes sense? Like, where in the world were you and, and what are they? Initially, I don't know. I have early memories, but I don't know if I really felt like I was home in any of them. Um, so what are, your early, what are some of your early memories? That... I remember my fourth birthday very clearly. Um, so I remember going to... The zoo, I don't really remember the zoo itself. I remember getting on the train. I remember what that station looked like. I remember we went for Chinese food that evening and we had frog's legs. Um, and I remember throwing away my dummy or my pacifier that day on my fourth birthday. I remember being stood at the kitchen. Um, we had like a concertina sliding door thing. 
and I remember being stood there. I remember the bin already had stuff in it, and I remember throwing it away. That's for me. That's probably the earliest memory um, that is clear. I don't know if I can really remember anything before that. Okay, and where where in the world were you? I was in Yule in Surrey. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you remember which zoo did you go to? Do you remember London? London Zoo. London yeah, Zoo. the big one. Got to remember, I'm I'm from the north, so you know, going to <laughs> is going London to Zoo, zoo not... and going to London would would I mean those two things together would be too much for a four year old in Yorkshire to to comprehend. <laughs> Even the train journey would probably have been beyond our level of excitement. <laughs> what 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 do you remember about throwing the dummy away? Was that like a conscious decision? Was it something that you felt you needed to do? Yeah, I think uh, it was something that my parents must have been encouraging me to do for some time because it was quite a pinnacle of a day, you know, your fourth birthday, you're big now. So, um, And as a parent, I know that fourth's quite late. So I must have been holding on to that thing for, for quite some time. It must have been a battle for my parents to be able to, to ask me to do that um, at that stage, yeah. And you mentioned um, a couple of things that would be interesting to pick up from that day as well. But uh, let's let's dig into the let's dig, dig into the idea of surrendering the dummy because I think it's it's really interesting that you, you've got a clear memory of time and a place when you were where I guess your parents would have said, "Well, this is home, you know, this is home for us now. This is home for us as a family." Um, but clearly, you don't have maybe you haven't necessarily felt all those same feelings of home necessarily in that moment. There are other things that spring to mind. And I wonder a bit about parenting and about how your parents parented you. Um, what do you think were some of the, 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 the strands that you picked up of, of what, what home meant for you from the way that your parents raised you? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the only time I really, the first time I became really conscious of the way they, because as a kid you don't really think about how you're being parented. You're just, they're your parents, yeah. right? So the first time I think I was really conscious of it was um, into my 20s already at church. And I understood, um, I guess, the idea of honour. And I, th- I guess I valued family already before that, but I, I can't really say why I knew I valued family. I knew that even though um, my parents and I may not have got on well at points in my teens, but there was, there was points where it was quite... Um, yeah, it was quite tense. There was a lot of fracture, I think, in our relationship during my teens. Um, I knew that they were always there for me. They were still um, very supportive. They would always be... Like, I remember being at university and just feeling really unwell. And the only person I really wanted to call was my mum. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that says to me that they, there was definitely a value of family. Um, and then I think... There were certain things with with the church where where we met, uh, where I felt they really resonated with me, and I only realised later that they were things that resonated with me because they were actually foundational things that my parents instilled in us as kids, which yeah. I which I think I'd probably just veered from in my early adulthood through my adolescence because um, I wanted to rebel, I wanted to do stuff they didn't want me to do. Um, grew up in a very strict Christian home with what felt like very strict Asian parents and um, th- I, I didn't give them a choice didn't even give them the chance really to parent me um, in my later teens um, into my into my 20s I think What do you think that rebellion against them was about? What do you think drove that? Um, at the time I would have described it like we both spoke different languages but I understood my parents' language, they didn't understand mine. And it was a real struggle to be able to um, communicate with them the way that I wanted to. Um, as I got older, that got easier, and I felt that I was able to communicate in their language, almost. Um, I think part of it is my schooling versus my home life was very different. At school, I was taught to be arrogant and um, to to tell everyone I was the best and at home I was told to be humble and um, and what was difficult was at school I didn't feel like I was confident enough to be arrogant or the best 
And so when I was comfortable in my own home situation, that's when my arrogance came out. And it was the worst place it could be. And I think that was really difficult during those years. Um, and yeah, and I think I've, I've learned from that as an adult. Yeah, I think it's really interesting some of the strands that you, you're picking up on there. Because I guess, you know, when you first messaged me about this conversation, you kind of said, do you think you can help me to understand why I feel at home more so now than where I have in the past? That's a fair summary of what you were kind of asking about, isn't it? It's, it sounds like the journey of someone coming to understand their culture um, or the cultures that have shaped them. And I, I say the cultures because it feels like it's been a kind of melting pot of different cultures that has come. And in many ways, it sounds like that represents the, the kind of Singaporean journey anyway, that actually it's a coming together of different cultures. But, mm. but it's interesting that you define your relationship with your parents as being about talking in different languages. Um, what, what, what were the languages, do you think? What, what, what uh, languages were you speaking? What language are they speaking? Not, you know, not literal language, but what was, the, what was it that was being communicated there, do you think? Um, I think I wanted to be more like a Westerner <laughs> uh, in, in some sort of way. I think I saw how my friends were and I wanted to be like that. Um, and they really didn't want me to be like that. And I don't think they saw it as a East versus West or anything like that, which it it may not have been that clear cut, but for me, I wanted to be more like the influences that I had. So do you think that they, your parents had a more, you, you describe them as the traditional kind of strict Asian parents? Yeah, they totally weren't actually, um, compared to a lot of friends out here in Asia, but I think in contrast to the UK and a lot of the parents my friends received, um, they seemed a lot harsher. Um, and it, you know, I'm I'm happy if that's just perception because I just wasn't getting things my own way. Uh, but I don't think it was. I do think there were. I think there were elements um, for sure um, where my parents were stricter. Yeah. Compared with your friends, compared with other people that you knew or just compared with what you thought they should they should be like? Um, probably a bit of both. I think maybe um, I definitely had friends whose interactions with their parents stand out to me um, and the way that they spoke to their parents was definitely not what I would call respectful um, now. But at the time, I sort of wanted that. Um, I felt like it was almost like they earn their stripes to be able to be rude to their parents and chat back and I think that's what I was kind of fighting for um, and ne you know now in Asia that you never have that that's never a it's not a way you earn your stripes um, it's it's just not done yeah what do you think it was like for your your parents navigating that oh it would have been hell <laughs> because um Firstly, my mum worked, um, she'd worked so hard when we were in our early childhood, she was able to retire, but she had to come out of retirement to keep me at school, basically. Um, they, my parents had to, I mean, the, loads of things, they had to move house to keep me in school. They put so much on the line, yet at times I think it seemed like school was the thing that was helping to craft me into an arrogant little sod. <laughs> And uh, while it was giving me a great education, and I'm very grateful for it, but I think the culture of it, and maybe it was the friends that I chose, although um, they were good people. I think I, maybe I was just struggling to strike the balance very well. And um, maybe the contrast that I saw was something that I was... It, maybe it was magnified because of the contrast, and so I wanted to be a magnification of what I'd seen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think you saw it more starkly than maybe your friends recognised it because of the fact that you came from a different a different starting point? Yeah, probably. Probably. Cause I, I, I guess because you went to a, you were privately educated yep. when you went. But I guess maybe there was a certain, you know, a certain culture that's there in a private school which maybe isn't as intentionally held in, in a state school in the UK. And maybe there's a picture of 
maintaining a sense of privilege and maintaining a sense you described it as the word arrogance i wonder i'm guessing that the school didn't didn't have that as the motto no was that wasn't their goal wasn't for you to be arrogant but i guess it was for you to have a certain confidence i suppose about the way you approach the world absolutely and i think it was great for that you know for a kid who um for me had been asked to leave my first state school I think to go into a school that was telling you that you're great was really helpful um, and I think what I struggled with was actually was just balancing it and and all the friends that I've stayed in touch with from, from that school I, I wouldn't say they're arrogant at all um, they're hard working good people <laughs> um, but and which has probably been baked into them by the system that they were educated in right yeah yeah for sure um, but um, but a very different cultural perspective, perhaps to to the one that you were coming from. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that's accurate. Which I guess, because I guess what I'm holding in mind here is the your journey to understanding where you feel all of those things that you've just described. Where you feel it's interesting that when you first talked about what does it mean for you, what is home? One of the things you said was it's a place where you feel fully yourself. Yeah. I guess that you you can you can see the wrestling of that, can't you? As you come through your childhood and into your adolescence, which is a time when all of us start to, you know, that's the time. You know, kids, when they're when we're what when we're you know when we're children, we don't feel like we necessarily need to rebel and stamp our own identity on against the family unit. But but actually, as you hit your adolescence, it's when you start to differentiate from your parents and start to forge your own place in the world. And it sounds like you were coming from well this is what I'm getting at school these are the people that I will look up to in my peer group and yet this when I get home I get a different reaction from my parents to the one that they do and they clearly are coming at it from a different angle to the one that I am yeah and that creates that tension um you mentioned an interesting you might use what we might call a euphemism when you said that you were asked to leave your other school <laughs> yeah I guess they didn't say hey John T you're too bright for all these other kids can you go somewhere else no tell us a bit um, about that I don't really remember um, exactly what happened. Um, I just know that my parents encouraged to move me on quite quickly, um, and they it, it was must have been urgent enough. I moved halfway through year four um, into a private system, um, and um, my parents don't say too much about it. I guess it must have been quite painful, um, and. Um, they say that the teacher that I had at the time couldn't cope with me very well. Um, yeah, I don't really know what my behaviours were like at the time. Um, yeah, challenging, I guess. Certainly. Yeah, certainly the, the 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 developmental psychiatrist in me wants to dig into that a bit more because sure. it's interesting that you don't remember it, um, and yet clearly you didn't have that problem. Did you have any problems when you moved to the new school? Um, was there a period of transition? Uh, yeah. Did you have to stop certain behaviours? Did they just tolerate things or address things differently? No, I definitely think? had moment. I definitely had a reputation of some sort at that first um, independent school that I went to. Um, there was this uh, great story where a French teacher was telling my parents how terribly behaved I was on the ferry on the way to um, the on the way to France for a trip, and my dad, um, he's great. So he just sat there and let her keep talking about how terrible I'd behaved, knowing full well that they hadn't put me on that boat. Um, so it was another child, but she had just assumed it was me because that was the reputation that I had had in the school. Um, I remember I'd been on report card, which was a thing that students only get if they're being monitored a bit more closely. Um, I remember one of my favourite teachers, actually, her name was Mrs Gerlach. She taught me D design, DT. And I remember um, she was pretty strict, but I liked her teaching. But there was one day I'd obviously got something really bad on my report card from her. And um, I didn't want my parents to see it, or at least I didn't want them to see it while we were still at school, where they could have gone to speak to her. Um, and I just remember trying to get my dad to leave quite quickly um, without checking my report card. And he checked my report card and then went in to see Miss Skirlak. So there must have been... <laughs> There must have been, you know, still challenging behaviours there. My underlying memories from that school were of a great music teacher um, who was very inspiring um, and of finding my fit when it came to sport and fitness, um, mm. which I never had those opportunities before that school. I found rugby, which was huge for me. 
um, at that school. I don't really remember yeah. all of the challenges that I had. Yeah. But they must have That's been there. interesting. It's interesting how you found those two things that helped to define your sense of identity. Because certainly if you'd asked me to describe you when we first met, the first, you know, in my first two sentences would have included the words rugby and music, I imagine. I remember our first conversations were about hearing stories of what you got up to with the, with the rugby boys. I remember asking if you played an instrument on Sunday, or I can't remember if it was me or our friend Owen, who, who you looked at the stage. I said, oh, can you play an instrument? And you looked at the stage and went, I can play everything on there. <laughs> Which I suppose also speaks perhaps a little to the confidence with which you carried yourself by yeah. that stage. And which is um, interesting because now, I, I've, I, again, you know, throughout, the, you, you get asked those questions at churches, you know. Um, moving to Singapore, we went to a new church and people say, oh, so you're a musician, what do you play? And I do feel it. I feel, I look over at the, the stage and I feel that moment of going, you know. All of that. I can, <laughs> you know, but uh, there is something in me that, feels that I shouldn't say it that way yeah yeah which is strange and um, we'll and we'll get to church because I think that's quite significant but I wanted to before we get there think about a bit about your grandfather I think his influence is significant isn't it yeah and I just wonder how how his influence speaks to some of the things that we've just been talking about yeah I think my my childhood memories of grandpa were, were not good ones were not positive ones I don't, I didn't associate him with kindness until I was a lot older, um, into my twenties mm. probably. Um, so um, he was very strict, um, more strict than uh, my parents were, and I just remember points where he made me feel incredibly guilty and um, just really physically horrible. Um, I felt nasty on the inside all the time at, at points um, and the reasons you know his strictness they, they would come in he would talk about the tidiness of my bedroom or um, the way that I would so in 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 Asian cuisine we tend to have a load of dishes in the middle and you, you, you scoop put it in your plate and then you eat that and I remember a time where I took a fork and poked a vegetable and ate it straight from the dish without it going into my plate and I just got nailed for that. Like he was really not happy about the way I did that. And my parents, you know, they didn't say anything. Or maybe, you know, I, I almost feel like there were points where they would have said, um, oh, don't do that, grandpa won't like that. Um, rather than this is something that I want to own. They still didn't want me to have the consequences, but they didn't really want to own the discipline themselves um, on those yeah. perhaps. Um, yeah, there was but one day in particular where I think it was just a bedroom situation, probably again, hadn't tidied something or, or other. Um, and bear in mind, I shared a bedroom with one of my sisters. Um, I think I remember him just getting really, really cross about the way it was and, and even said to me that he didn't love me and that he loved my sisters um, more. And that I remember just felt like it completely broke me um I I went into school crying that day um I had to lie because I didn't want to tell everyone about what had happened um I told them that my cat had died um I had a cat I don't really remember what happened to the cat or whether it was dead by then or not but um you yeah, didn't kill it to cover it up I didn't kill the cat no to cover up this thing um but um yeah that was pretty painful that was actually the same year that I was asked to leave so I wonder what was going on in my eight-year-old brain or heart um, while all of that was going on. Yeah, and I, I wonder, I wonder a bit about what was going on for your grandfather as well, because yeah. I think what's interesting is when you think about his cultural background. I mean, what was his? Where, where does he? How so do he's, a, he he's a he's a Puranakan. Uh, Puranakan uh, is also known as uh, straight-born Chinese. Um, straits are the Straits of Malacca, so Singapore, Johor, Malacca, that sort of area around here. So yeah, and, and the Pranakans, so his dad's generation, they had a reputation of being very strict. Um, mm. They were, uh, particularly the men, they felt they needed to uphold their traditional Chinese values, but also 
to be able to show that they could um, cope and play the game in a Western dominated society as well. And so they had this immense, immense pressure of upholding uh, something that was precious to them, yet trying to fit into something else, um, mm -hmm. which I could imagine was quite difficult. Um, so my great grandfather, his, my granddad's, my grandpa's dad, um, loved cricket. He would go down to the Padang, which is an area here, and, and watch cricket every weekend. He would wear like um, a, a, a fancy Englishman's top hat uh, and a suit in Singapore weather, which is 30 degrees most days. Um, but that's how much he upheld the, the trying to be part of the Western vibe. But he was also trying to, you know, they, they would also try to maintain their, their, their Chinese heritage too. Um, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it, to reflect on how you've experienced the same thing of the kind of um, archetypally English, British upbringing from a school perspective and yet the kind of strict Asian parenting and actually to think about how that is part of your granddad's story as yeah. well and wonder which bits of that he was navigating and you were navigating when there were those moments when you and he didn't get on so well. Yeah, that's, yeah, really, really interesting um, to think. Yeah, particularly for his dad, I think. But my grandpa, I guess he was a second generation of that, trying to work out where their fit was. Um, yeah. He was, I mean, he taught, he's one of four boys. He talks about how he was the favourite. Um, never got smacked, apparently, uh, which is quite unique, I think, for that day and age. Um, his dad supposedly showed him favour over the other three boys. Um, they didn't seem to mind, from what I know. But, um, yeah, I found that interesting. Um, particularly with the way that he he behaved with me when I was a child, I think to hear as an adult that he was a favourite and he loved the fact that he wasn't disciplined in the way that the others were made me kind of wonder well, what, why didn't you treat me like that um, yeah and you know I was the only boy I don't know whether that had anything to yeah. do it, with it as well I'm his only male grandson from his only son so there is that responsibility of carrying on the, the family name and, and whatever I, I don't know whether that has much to do it but it may do yeah, I mean, it's interesting how you mentioned that it comes across around some flashpoints, maybe that as well from a kind of cultural perspective, like you said, like eating straight from the bowl, not putting it on your plate, that actually that's not the done thing. Whereas yeah. I guess probably if I came round your house and did that, people wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, feels so rude, because yeah. they would understand that I didn't understand the cultural context, but actually you were expected to um, and would be punished for not doing so or, or you know, picked out for not doing so yeah and I think even now with our friendship groups here in Singapore no one's really that fussed about that sort of stuff um, yeah. maybe it's just maybe it's filtered through not filtered through maybe it's been diluted over the time um, but yeah it's not really a big deal yeah so I was thinking because I was thinking a bit because I think one of the terms that we could use is the idea of being a third culture kid isn't it for yeah you, that absolutely actually, very much the two cultures coming together and then you know you create your own culture within that um and that's where i wanted to think a bit about church actually because it almost adds another culture to the experience doesn't it you've got your the culture of your parents you've got the culture of your school and your upbringing and then you find some sense of identity some sense of home when you walk through the doors of this church which also has that strong sense of culture yeah um, i wonder yeah. A, a bit do you want to talk about that a bit? I don't know. I think it actually bridged the gap between the two that I struggled with. Um, it had a very... Um, it had the honour and it had the strong sense of discipline um, that I think I grew up with at home. Um, but it had, on the, on the faith side of things and the God side of things, a confidence that I was allowed to have um, and in a positive way because the confidence wasn't I think arrogance your confidence in yourself and what you can do and I think in church life my confidence came from somewhere else and it wasn't a self-reliance that I had anymore um, and I'm sure you know 
definitely in the early years there was still a lot of self-reliance that was coming through um and you know i i had how many years of education of being told to be self-reliant and i think that still probably shapes me a little bit now i'm quite sure of myself but i think um i think more of it these days is is in is in god rather than in myself um i felt that um pastor tom was someone who um actually looking back on him and um the way that we interacted he was very asian um you know i found him to be very clear cut quite black and white i strangely gelled with it i say strangely because i think i'd been rebelling against that for such a long time but i think there was a greater purpose behind the way that tom spoke to us and um that gave me um it it fit it made sense to to me um at the time um and i think it was the first time in a while that it had made sense i guess you know and part of it tom tom was um he disciplined me like a father um like an asian father at times without without the stick <laughs> you know i think it just went to highlight that asian parents discipline out of love in the same way that tom did um he saw um actually i don't think he necessarily saw fault and failings i think he saw what could be and yeah. focused on that and tried to um at points perhaps harshly i think beat out what was not good um i think beat is probably a bit of a harsh word for what i actually experienced but I think at points at the time I felt like I was quite happy to receive the 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 maybe emotional beating uh, in in those situations um I was yeah. prepared to to take it because I knew that he wanted something better for me yeah. um and I think that was in stark contrast to how I was with my parents maybe only 3 years 4 years earlier than that um when they were doing exactly the same thing but I was resistant do you think you came to understand your parents better in the light of your relationship with Tom um potentially i'm not sure i'd never really thought about it that way i'd thought about it that so growing up part of the strictness from my parents was the asian thing and part of it was the church thing and i think as i got more into the church thing i felt like we understood each other a bit better i don't know whether i understood my parents better through that i think tom helped me to become more aligned with how my parents wanted me to be okay. um and that probably opened up our relationship more my parents and i especially as now like my parents and i have one of the best i would say one of the best mm-hmm. relationships a, a a son and parent could have um yeah. in their 30s stick late late 20s yeah yeah early th- early 30s for both of us isn't it um and that's the other thing that i wonder about in your journey is the fact that actually there's always been you know obviously your parents loved you they wouldn't have spent what they did and made the sacrifices they did if they didn't love you it sounds like that's something your grandfather was communicating in a different way because it's really interesting that he used that that, that that's the thing that you found most difficult mm. that was the, the thing that you almost associate almost you felt it like a bereavement that was the comparison that you used when you had to explain it for your friends at school is that actually he said i don't love you and you took that as though you had lost something lost lost a loved one mm. um and it's interesting to them that actually the the, the importance of love being spoken alongside that toughness and that discipline is is striking to me to think about the impact of that yeah yeah i hadn't thought about it that way that's very insightful i think that kind of links to um to this helper that we had um when i was growing up so mm. um the filipina helper who, yeah who came from from singapore with us she was from the philippines which was up essentially my parents brought her into our home um in time for my birth and then when we moved to the UK they said to her why don't you come with us and she said she'd love to so she came with us to the UK um as a live-in helper um i guess in british terms it's a bit a bit like an au pair 
Um, yeah. Um, it's not a terribly British thing, is it? But it's quite an Asian not thing. Not at all. Yeah. But here it's very common. Very common to have yeah. a helper in the home. Um, and when she left at, when I was six, again, that was, you know, you talk, you asked me about my early memories. Pretty much from throwing away my dummy, my pacifier, into the bin at four, everything's blurry until I was six and I was saying goodbye to her. Um, there was no like significant moment where I can go, oh, yeah, I remember this day or I remember this sort of thing until the day that she left um, when I was six. And I can vividly remember her walking through the gates at Heathrow Airport and I was just bawling my eyes out. I was trying to get to her. My parents had to hold me back. Um, she was my parent for the first six years. Mum worked. She would leave. I think that she got on the 613 train and she would go into central London. She would work and then she'd come home about 6 p.m. Um, in time for... not. I don't think she was always in time for dinner either. Um, well, no, I think we ate later. She must have been home in time for dinner. But... Uh, you know, and my dad was studying for a master's and then working as a teacher, so his hours would have been the same as similar to my mum, really. Um, so I think, you know, when she went, that was a huge, um, a huge moment for me as a child. Devastating. Um, and again, that sense of family, I think, was probably fractured at that point. Um, I recently, when I was thinking back to all my journey and, and everything, realised that the first time since then, uh, the, the only time since then that I start, I felt that loss, um, and the first time I'd say I felt depression uh, was at 16, when my older sister went away. She'd mm. uh, gone for a gap year. And I'd, I remember sitting at the dinner table one night, and I was like, just couldn't contain tears at 16, um, crying and my dad being like what's the matter and I'm just saying oh, I really miss my sister Miss Charmaine and I guess through through lack of education or understanding he was just pull yourself together man what are you doing your big sister's just left for a few weeks and, and yeah. I just remember that being quite a painful time as well and I think that they're definitely linked um, now sort of understanding what kids go through as a as an educator, um, I can definitely see the links for how I felt and that that separation um, yeah. at that point. Yeah, and I and get I wonder as well as the sense. So I, know you get... I was going to say, Charmaine, my older sister, definitely took on that that role of almost covered what Lita was to me at that point. Um, she became that second parent or the next parent along for my parents for sure. Yeah, so she filled that gap. Yeah. In a sense. It was a perceived gap, perhaps, as well, because obviously your parents were interested yeah. and yeah, just not able to be there for, for good reason, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, I wonder about the link that she represented to Singapore as well. I know she, she wasn't, she was from the Philippines, but actually in terms of the link for you. Yeah, maybe to Asia rather than Singapore specifically. Um, but... Yeah, I I wonder. I know that I was the only one out of me and my sisters who had her as a focused helper for for me. Um, mm -hmm. My older sister um, lived her first couple of years in the UK. When she lived in Singapore, then I was born. Um, she was already three, going to preschool. So I think there was a bit of less involvement on that side of things. And then, um, and then my younger sister was born in the UK um, and mum was around should have had maternity leave as normal maternity yeah. leave in Singapore is much shorter than in in the UK so mm -hmm. I think mum would have been around a lot more for my younger sister in yeah. those very early stages so yeah I do I do wonder whether that had a huge part to play too um, one that I'm researching at the moment yeah and coming let's move back to your university experience I yep. wonder how much as well that actually your time at university was about you discovering a sense of your purpose as well as your identity you know when I think about what, where you were when you first came in you know, studying music maybe not a clear sense of what you what you intended to do with life I guess mm. I remember you going through different jobs and selling shoes which came in really handy for our household because we were never short of shoes and clothes um, yeah 
Yeah, I'm probably responsible for the amount of clothes you have in your house. Yes, yeah. There's definitely another version of this interview where where you can talk to my wife about that because <laughs> um, she has to deal with it now. But um, but but you kind of went from that, didn't you? Working mm. different jobs and, and such like. To it felt like when you left Norwich, you had a much clearer sense of purpose. From 2014 till um, when did we leave Norwich? 2018. So in those four years, I was kind of going through. Um, maybe three parallel journeys um, that kind of intertwined with each other a little bit too. One of them was that church one, was re- like rediscovering a purpose that was beyond myself, like I talked about earlier, not even having that self-assurance, but um, uh, uh, that that level of faith, I guess. Um, professionally with work, I was beginning to mm. find my passion for, um, for education and seeing um, children be able to achieve much more and to be able to um, be much more um, through what I could give them and then since 2014 was really navigating that idea that Singapore was home or at least felt different when I was here and understanding what that meant for my future um, when I had such a strong understanding of belonging to here um, I needed to kind of work that bit out too. So they were kind of parallel, three parallel lines that were happening, I think, from about 2014 onwards. Um, and obviously navigating new seasons of parenthood um, from 2013 onwards probably had a lot to do with it too. Um, yeah. you, you do, as a parent, you might be getting to the stage now uh, with a month to go, or a month and a half to go. Um, but trying to figure out where you want your kids to grow up and what environment you want for them and what you think is going to be best for them and what sort of education you might be able to afford them whether it's a really good state school or whether you want to take the private route or you know in the UK you're looking at boarding or you know what what are these options that you want to have and what's going to work for your children I think all of that I was working out they were all intertwined they were all parallel Um, and yeah and I think that was that was, you know, for me with with working in schools. Um, firstly, in the UK, teachers don't get paid very well. So, the, if you really want a child to have a great private education, if that's the, dis, the the decision that you want to make for your children, then you kind of want to look to get a job in a private school. So, you know, there's so much going on yeah. um, with all of that. Um, yeah, and it changes. You know, you, you you're not allowed to be selfish anymore, um, yeah. which is probably the hardest bit of parenting for me. <laughs> Do you find yourself reflecting on how you you were parented as well? Definitely. I think um, I've actually got this weird, um, I don't want to call it anger, but there's this, there's this a very firm parenting hand that I feel like I need to push down a little bit sometimes with my kids. I feel like I could be harsh. Um, I wonder whether I what I feel is what my grandpa felt and I never want to behave that way I never want to make my kids feel the way that I felt I mean I would never ever tell my kids I didn't love them or anything like that um, but I could definitely I, I get particularly cross if they don't listen to Millie or they're outright disrespectful to Millie I can't like that is blood how to make John T's blood boil 101 is to disrespect his wife um, and I think I find that even harder with the kids because it's their mum and I know what she does for them I know how much she loves them and how much she um, sacrifices for them and how much they're at the forefront of her mind all the time and sometimes kids are kids and they're just out of order to their parents and th- at those points I feel like I need to kind of tell my inner Asian parent to back down a little bit and to be a little yeah. bit more lenient, um, yeah, yeah, and and things that we you know think things that we decided early on that we weren't going to smack our children, for example, yeah. um, just the thought that you know how are you going to discipline a child if they hit someone, <laughs> smack them, uh, didn't really make sense to us, um, yeah. So we just um, so these things are things that I've had to that aren't necessarily the most natural. Um, style of parenting for me but they're definitely the one that I am consciously choosing 
even if I might not be subconsciously acting upon um, if that makes sense yeah. so my subconscious I feel like I'm fighting it sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah that it comes back up again yeah. you wonder how much that was the experience that your parents and your grand grandfather had as well yeah I mean like the other day um, I was on FaceTime to my mum and her dog was being terrible and she flicked her slipper off her foot and smacked it on the chair to like get the dog to stop what the dog was doing. I vividly remembered in that moment, I was like, ah, the slipper's coming out. Um, and so, you know, my mum definitely gave me a good old smack with a slipper every now and again, um, which, you know, is, is just part of of what I grew up with yeah. and, and it so was acceptable in the 80s right it was definitely acceptable. <laughs> definitely and and probably still acceptable now in in Asia at, um, in, in areas here I don't think it's frowned upon um, I think they still see it as hard discipline yeah. and that's interesting too because my my kids on the flip side you know they might be growing up with the opposite <laughs> of what I was growing up with thinking why don't our parents why, why don't they hear us <laughs> why are my parents so lenient I just want them to discipline me I don't know if they ever think that but um, yeah there's definitely a contrast it's fascinating it's been really interesting to dig into this um, and um, you know maybe it's time for me to try and kind of draw to some kind of a conclusion I mean I guess part of what you asked me to maybe help you to understand was why where you are now feels more like home from the places you've been before and I wonder how much that is about how the place that you are find yourselves in connects to the journey that you've been on yourself what's striking when you described Singapore for me um, yesterday was that you talked about it as a place where lots of cultures come together um, and actually that that's always been its identity that there's never been, that it's always about multiple different cultures coming together and it feels like that's very much a part of your story and I'm, I'm really struck by what you said when you described that place at home and there's things that you've drawn out that we would traditionally think of with home, that actually you've talked about Singapore being a place of safety, that you've talked about it being a place of a certain degree of prosperity, a place where you can raise your family. And I think those are all things that, you know, for everyone, they would they would say are part of their idealised sense of home. I also wonder a bit about your sense of identity um, as being a big part of this, that actually it's a place where you feel like, you know, that you can be the person that you are, that your identity is realised, I guess. And it's it's interesting when you look at the span of what's gone on, how the different parts of your journey have drawn out your identity. You know, the, the Asian-ness of the way your parents raised you, the, 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 the then the cultural, the Western culture that you were dropped into in, the, mm. in a very intentional way in the school that you were a part of, and then the difference that, that you talked about how church helps you to understand and draw out some of those aspects and I just wonder whether this where you are now is a is a place where that identity has helped to, to spin further out that actually some of those threads have just become more intertwined and it's as much about understanding yourself as it is also about that resonating with the place that you've come to live yeah I don't know how helpful that is that's cool I think that, yeah there's and there's a lot of little thoughts that you've given me throughout the conversation that I've not really considered before and it's helped to bring clarity to um, understand this journey a little bit as well I think I said it to you yesterday but I don't really feel like there's anything missing and yeah. um, but I'm really enjoying what I'm finding and I'm almost at times when I'm looking at my journey and thinking about it and having these sort of conversations I'm almost seeing it as a case study and <laughs> I can every now and again I'm pinpointing it to students who I teach and in an international school you go oh they're going through that as well and um, yeah it's really interesting there's such a personal side to it but there's also such a broad side to it too which I'm enjoying understanding it's interesting to think about how yeah how your cultural cultural home fits with some of your your heritage but also your understanding of yourself and where you're able to express that I think yeah I quite like not standing out here you know yeah I, I could walk down the street. I mean, apparently I've got a Western walk, but I can... I've always thought that about you. Yeah, well. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether that, do I walk like John Wayne? Is that what they mean by a Western? Um, I think if I walk down the street, you don't necessarily necessarily see me. I think I just blend into everything, which I quite like. Um, I think one of the things growing up, 
I was very conscious of my race um, and maybe that's another thought I, I can just be me without having to be labelled um, yeah. which is funny because Millie obviously is the opposite to that here yeah. but it, it, with it with its broad spectrum of cultures here I don't know whether she feels it as much she feels it in the local markets um, but the moment she says she's married to Singaporean they just chill they just mm. treat her like one of the locals um, yeah it's interesting to think about how much that acceptance is part of the culture of Singapore I guess yeah yeah it's not perfect but it's getting there yeah um, and I think it's found its foundations clearly laid out um, what they wanted it to be and it's yeah. definitely closer to that accepting multicultural city than anywhere else I've experienced in the world so far yeah, um, yeah. because everybody here is an immigrant I hope you enjoyed that conversation and learning or going deeper a little bit into my story there and um, there's a lot of raw emotion that I shared a lot of stories that are very personal there um, and I have asked permission of all those people whether I can share those stories with you too so uh, I hope you enjoyed that this is probably going to be my last episode of the local immigrant as it stands um, I feel pretty happy with how things are in terms of my self-discovery and um, the book is done my, I'm still discovering myself I'm still figuring out things about being at home here in Singapore but it has a slightly different expression now um, I'm learning more about my country learning more, more about the people of my country and I'd love it if you would join me on some of those discoveries over on my other YouTube channel John T Tan the link is just below um, I've really really appreciated the way that you've all joined me on this journey and um, for those of you who've been reading my book I really appreciate the took this too um, it's been it was on the um, bestseller shelf for 17 weeks which has really blown my mind to be honest and I've met so many people who've talked about how the book has given them a sense of freedom and a sense of community knowing that other people are going through similar things and similar feelings to what they're going through as well and I hope that continues to do so it has um, gone beyond all of my expectations and I'm incredibly Incredibly grateful and um, so thank you very much and uh, I hope to see you more on the journey um, wherever it takes me in the coming weeks months and maybe even years take care now bye